Hey everyone, welcome to the presentation. We're going to go over some basics today. We're going to cover some of the things you can and can't control when you're applying for federal grants. People tend to get overwhelmed by all the facets of grant applications, but if you focus on the things you can control, your proposals should be reasonably competitive. All right, let's get into it. Now let's start with the short list, the things you cannot control. Now those first two, first two points are very much tied into each other. So you can't control the amount of funds appropriated by Congress and by extension, uh, the number of awards being made by the funding agency. Your competition. Now this is especially important when you are faced with a grant opportunity making, say, less than 10 grant awards. Uh, when only, you know, when only a handful or less than 10 awards are being made, you really need to take into consideration your potential competition. Are you going to be going up against you know, much larger organizations in, uh, say, you know, bigger cities or counties than yours that can document, you know, a lot more, uh, a lot more need shall we say, than, than your organization, you know, if um, if you're going to be going up against a lot of those, you know, what I call heavyweights, um, sometimes it's better to take a step back and say, look, you know, is, is the time and effort we're going to put into this application for, you know, a real slim chance of funding, is that worth it? Or should we, you know, should we wait for a better opportunity where, you know, maybe a couple of dozen grants are being made. So your competition, size it up before you decide to apply. Geographic distribution. All right. You know, this is an interesting one. You might have an absolutely, you know, killer proposal. But if you're clustered geographically with a few other high scoring proposals, the funding agency could pass you over if you don't score high enough uh, or if you're on the bubble. Uh, they could pass you over to spread the grants around geographically throughout the U.S. Instead of, you know, the funding agencies don't like, you know, clusters uh, of funded applications. You know, they don't like a whole bunch in one area. They kind of like to, they like to spread them out as evenly as possible across the U.S. So geographic distribution can sometimes it can sometimes work for you, but also sometimes against you. Uh, agency priorities. Now, obviously, these are th that's something you can't control. These are the priorities made by the agency within the context or limitations of the authorizing legislation. Oh, the deadline. Well, definitely not something you can control. The calendar waits for no one. Politics, uh, like it or not, politics always plays a role. And this this ties in with geographic distribution. Uh, so you might benefit or you might get shafted by how projects are scattered around the country. So, for example, if California has three projects above the funding line and and that's the the fun, the 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 scoring amount that you have to score, uh, the number, the score. This is getting confusing. The score above which you have to receive in order to receive funding. That the funding line. Um, and New York has two projects. Chances are the review committee or the funding agency officials aren't going to recommend another California project. They're likely going to look for another New York project near that funding cut line. So there's balance between, you know, those two big states. And the only way to get around this is to make sure your project scores so high, the review committee can't ignore or deny you. So you want to be just, you want to knock it out of the park. I mean, obviously you want to do that every time, but that's how you, that's how you get away from this whole political geographic distribution uh, game, as I like to call it. And politics 2.0. Now, 
if this geographic distribution is kind of the, the micro level, the politics 2.0 is kind of the macro political level. You can't control who's in the White House and which party controls the House or Senate, you know, in any given term. So if you're if your party of choice is on the outs at the moment, look, don't sweat it uh, and don't try to fight it. Going after grants requires bending with the wind versus fighting it. So just watch how things unfold and play within whatever new rules or priorities emerge. Uh, it, it's, it's all in how you adapt, adjust, and position yourself for each new administration and Congress. And finally, the reviewers. Some, I'd say, in fact, most are industry experts and will or should understand your proposal. With that said, not everyone is an expert, or they might be having a bad day or be at the end of reviewing a dozen proposals. So the translation there, your message might not get through at that moment when your reviewer reads and scores your proposal. And that could that could hurt you. So you got to make sure your proposal is written in a way that's reader friendly for the layperson or an expert reviewer who's already read a number of proposals and, you know, might be a little weary or blurry eyed at the moment when they get to yours. All right, let's spend some time on the things you can control. This is a much longer list. So settle in, get comfortable, get an extra cup of coffee if you need it. Um, I'll be right here waiting for you. Okay, let's go. So first things first, checking the federal register and grants.gov every day. This is essential. Um, not every grant opportunity posts to the Federal Register and Grants.gov at the same time. You would think you'd think it would, but it doesn't. So sometimes a grant may post on the Federal Register, and then three, five, ten days later, it shows up on Grants.gov. Sometimes the reverse. Sometimes it shows up on Grants.gov and then doesn't appear in the Federal Register for another, you know, couple of days or even a week later. Uh, occasionally they, they're in sync, but not always. So that's why it's, it's very important to always check both sources every day, uh, because you don't want to miss anything. And with, uh, with grant windows or application windows kind of shortening up to 45 and 30 days now, it's really important to stay on top of it. So you don't lose any time. So it's federalregister.gov and grants.gov. Starting early, definitely something you can control. So once a grant opens, form your team, craft your project concept, and assign responsibilities, and get rolling. Now, this is kind of a subset of the previous point. Deciding too late to get started is definitely something you can control. Simply put, simply put don't do it, or at the very least, try to avoid it. Uh, if you can... Set a drop-dead date beyond which you won't apply. So, you know, if we don't have our shit together 10 days before the deadline, we're not going to do it. The stuff you throw together on short notice is I mean, not always, but is usually garbage and has little chance of being funded. There are just so many moving parts within a federal application. If you're trying to jam something together say, in five days. It's just, I can't say it's impossible because anything's possible if you're willing to work the hours, but uh, sometimes it's just, it's not quite worth it. So if you can, set that drop-dead date. Hey, look, we got to get this, everything together 
I would say at least 10 days uh, before a deadline. And if you can't do that, just pass and wait for the next one. Establishing go-to external partners. Now, what I, what I mean by this is you want to well ahead of time, even you know, long before you decide to apply for any grants, create relationships with external partners so you always have a handful of organizations you can go to when an opportunity opens up. Now, partnerships are absolutely essential with federal grants nowadays. But most grant applicants, though, especially in the public sector, uh, they tend to shy away from collaborations. They want to control every aspect of the project. You know, and I can appreciate that, but you can, you can still control the project and its direction if you are kind of the lead applicant. But a lot of times, you know, it makes more sense to have an external partner perform services than to try and handle everything in-house. So get those partnerships and relationships established early so that when a grant opens up, you can just get on the phone or email to your partner and say, hey, look, this grant opened up, got an idea of how we want to work together. Let's talk it out. Let's see if we can make it work and get rolling. Knowing when to pass on a grant opportunity. See, now, not every grant is a good fit. It's really, really tempting to apply for everything, but the shotgun approach, you know, it sets you up for long-term failure. Going after federal grants needs to be strategic and focused. It's important to have self-awareness in terms of your staff capacity, the available time, the project fit with funding requirements and so on that allows you to say, no, this grant isn't for us. Let's wait. Now, by contrary, or by, by contrast, or on the other hand, when the right opportunity drops, drops into your lap, or you see it on grants.gov, be ready to go all in. And the key here is preparation. Now, this isn't a time for, oh, shit, there's money available. What should we do? No. You want to have a prioritized list of projects that you want or need funded, say, 1 through 10. And when the right grant appears, you already have a concept. You already have a team on board that's ready to go, and you can get to work. And establishing relationships with your congressional delegation. So whether you are a small nonprofit or a large organization, it's important to get to know your elected officials and their staff members, both at the state and federal levels. Uh, now, if you're with a nonprofit, a lot of times you think, oh my gosh, we, we're a nonprofit, we can't do lobbying. Um, you know, now direct lobby, I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's true. I'm not an attorney. I haven't, I haven't looked at the, you know, these rules lately. But the thing is, you know, a lot of nonprofits do, you know, I, I guess you could call it lobbying, but really it's what they're doing is quote unquote communications and outreach, uh, what, you know, cities, counties, public agencies, they are all meeting with their congressional delegations. And there's no reason that you as a nonprofit can't do the same and have similar outreach or communications efforts. Because really what you're doing is you're not just, you're not really lobbying for a particular bill or trying to get something done that's very specific. You're just simply providing communications or outreach about your organization uh, in very broad terms, what kind of services you provide, what kind of benefits you offer to your community. So that's really what we're going for here. So if you can, take a trip to D.C. Not only can your congressional delegation staff uh, help you with 
any problems you have with administrative agencies, but they can provide you with support letters for grant applications. So, you know, it's really important if, if the cities and counties in your area, they're all going to DC, you know, if you can, if you can find room in your budget, you really need to get on board with, uh, you know, connecting and communicating with your congressional delegations. And if you can't, if you can't go to DC, wait until, wait until they're on a break and the, the local offices, you know, really gear up and are, are more accessible to you. So maybe try that. Knowing when to go against the grain. Okay, against the grain. Now, here's what I mean by that. You have to know when to apply for a grant, even if you don't have initial buy-in from everyone. I mean, when you first pitch a grant to your team, the natural response from people is going to be how a new grant program will impact their department you know, in the micro. And that's fine. I mean, that's always going to say, hey, look, we take on this new grant. It's going to be more reporting, more staff time devoted to paperwork, more staff devoted to fill in the blank. No problem there. I mean, that's human nature. Everyone has to look out for the department uh, and their, their own team members. Totally understandable. That's okay. You know, address, you know, any and every concern they have point by point, and how the grant will benefit not only their department, you know, specifically in terms of additional resources, you know, allay their fears about the reporting requirements, because the grant will be able to pay for, you know, a part-time person to do that. I mean, whatever. But also let them know how, how <clears throat> excuse me, how the grant will benefit the organization in the macro, you know, expanded services, uh, local credibility, community impact, and so on. Data. Do you have the data? And can you present it in a meaningful and understandable way to support the need for your proposed project? I mean, I could have put... And I probably should have put data like almost right at the top of this list. I mean, this is really in no prioritized order, but now that I think about it, this is so important. Um, you really, if you're going to, if you're going to propose a project, you have to have the data to support uh, the need for the project. And local data is of course preferred over statewide uh, and or national level data. Application workflow. You know, one of the best and worst things about grants is deadlines. I mean, deadlines are a pain in the ass because, well, if, if you don't meet them, you have no chance of receiving funding. But deadlines, on the other hand, are great for organizing workflow. I sound a little too excited about that, but I, I do get excited about this because you can start Start with the deadline and work backwards to present day, marking major, you know, milestones on your calendar along the way. So like when you want drafts available for review or when forms should be completed, uh, when letters of support should be received and so on, you know, just to name a few, uh, you know, like I said, as much as people stress out about deadlines because, you know, it's a date certain you got to get that grant in by, you should also use deadlines to your advantage to plan, you know, plan your application process and how your team is going to work together uh, and, and assigning responsibilities and all that stuff. Uh, oh, the evaluation of the, the evaluation matrix. So don't just, when you're going through your uh, RFP or your request for proposals. Don't don't just respond to the questions 
in the application, flip to the back of the RFP and take a look at the evaluation matrix to see what the reviewers will be considering. A lot of times they're they spell it out for you. You know, the evaluators, the the, the or the the grant review team will be looking at A, B, C, and D, whatever. So take a look at the evaluation matrix and craft your responses accordingly. Many times the evaluation matrix will offer hints on details you should provide in your narrative that maybe you hadn't uh, maybe you hadn't considered. The project evaluator. This is it's another. It's an interesting little. Uh, it's an interesting point that not many uh, people think about. If you can bring a project evaluator on board during your uh, proposal or application development process to help you create a solid evaluation plan for your application. I mean, nearly. Nearly every proposal submitted to a federal funding agency requires some type of evaluation plan. And I don't know about you, I can come up with a basic one, but I like to I like to bring an evaluator on board early on. It may cost you a few bucks, but they will frequently come up with an evaluation plan far superior to to what you and I can develop. I mean, I don't want to speak for you because maybe you already have a lot of experience with evaluation, but speaking for myself, I mean, I have some experience, but I'm always really impressed with what evaluators think of. I mean, they, well, that's their job. So I like to defer to the experts. Scalability. Now, what I mean here, this is in terms of budget, really, budget and programming but they're tied together. Um, create a, a, a project budget that is realistic, sustainable, and scalable. That is, design your program so, so it can be expanded or contracted based on demand and funding ebbs and flows. So, you know, don't overspend with fancy you know, Cadillac or Rolls-Royce budgets, you know, reviewers know when you're padding. But on the other hand, don't underspend or under budget either. Uh, requesting too little doesn't make your program more attractive. If reviewers sense that you're not asking for enough and you're not providing matching funds, to fill the gap, that'll raise a red flag. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They'll wonder, you know, they'll wonder naturally if you're cutting corners somewhere. And all of this relates to capacity and competency. So the solution is ask for what you need. No more, no less. And sustainability, this is the four-letter word that not many people like to talk about. But you really, you have to take program, sustainable, program sustainability seriously. You know, we'll apply for another grant later is not a serious plan. So spend some time to come up with a plan and present it. And it's totally realistic and reasonable to say we are using this federal grant to pilot or test this pro this project we're proposing and if it turns out to be successful we will either you know in 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 full strength of what we're proposing now or maybe we'll scale it back a little bit but we will if it's successful we will incorporate this new program into our annual operating budget that's a totally reasonable sustainability um, uh, answer because it's it's 
it, you know, it's perfectly okay to say, look, we're just testing this. We're just testing this program. We don't have the money to experiment, but if it turns out that our, our proposal works, then damn right, we'll put it into our annual budget. We'll figure it out. So, I mean, there's, there's one idea, but not many people, how many people like to, you know, go out on a ledge like that, but that's a totally legitimate sustainability plan. Registrations. I like this one. So register with the system for award management at sam.gov and register with grants.gov early on. In fact, do it, I would say today, even if you don't think you're going to apply for a federal grant for six months, eight months, 10 months down the road. Even if you have no idea if you're ever going to apply for a federal grant, it doesn't hurt to register early. And in fact, it can hurt you if you wait until the last minute, because sometimes the process can take a while. I mean, depending on, depending on the system load, how many people are also trying to register, um, and if they're down for maintenance, I mean, there's a whole number of reasons. Sometimes registrations with system for award management and grants.gov, it can take two to three weeks. And if you're in the process of apl applying for a grant and you're down to that last two weeks or one week before deadline, you know, registering for these systems is not an additional task that you want your, on your plate or, you know, weighing on your mind, weighing on your shoulders, whatever expression you want to use. So get it out of the way early. If you're registered early and it's all taken care of, all you have to do is focus on creating the strongest proposal possible, and then you can just apply. You don't even have to worry about this registration stuff. Formatting. So I talked a little bit about this earlier. You want to make your proposal as reader friendly as possible. You want to connect the dots for your reviewers. How does your project and your responses connect to the RFPs questions and the evaluation criteria? Make your layout easy on the eyes. This is kind of difficult uh, when it, you know when you've got when you have a limited number of pages uh, to work with. You know, some grants are as few as 20 pages, and then some go up to 50 and 80 and even more, and some are unlimited, but most times grants will have a page limit. So this, this can be tough, but use as much open space or what I call white space as possible. Uh, use, use bullet points when appropriate and, um, and make use of tables, you know, anything anything that breaks up you know page after page of dense narrative text people love bullet points people love tables uh, you know it just if you're reading paragraph after paragraph I mean it's it's so refreshing when you finally come to a, a nice simple table that lays out you know that lays out the information that could have taken like three paragraphs to describe so um, Oh, parallel, parallel the RFPs section headings in your proposal. So, so it's easy for reviewers to go back and forth while they, while they read your proposal. You know, if they see a section heading in your proposal, they can connect it back to the section heading in the RFP. So they kind of know where you are and they know which you know questions uh, you're responding to so the easier the easier you make it for reviewers uh, to read your proposal the better off you'll be uh, proofreading 
I think organizations are getting better at this, but it's still worth mentioning. Uh, always, always, always have someone read and critique your proposal before you submit it. If they understand your message and your vibe, you're probably good to go. If they struggle and if they're asking a lot of questions that you thought were obviously explained uh, in your narrative, eh, it might be time to make some revisions. Jargon. Uh, so try to avoid using a lot of industry lingo or acronyms and expressions. Chances are the reviewers will understand, but hmm, you never know when your proposal will be read by a non-expert or, you know, maybe you'll get an, uh, an expert reviewer who's absolutely sick and tired of, of her profession's jargon. So keep your message simple and straightforward and as little lingo as possible. Systems, policies, and procedures. Oh, boy. Before you apply for your federal grants, you want to make sure that your organization's internal control systems, procedures, and written policies are squared away. You know, Uncle Sam wants to see that you have, you know, the financial and management controls in place so they can feel comfortable the, that the public funds will be safeguarded if they give a, a grant award to your organization. And finally, I know, here we are, we've reached the end of the road. Finally, is your organization truly ready to apply for federal grants? You know, federal grants aren't, aren't for every organization. You know, they require a certain level of experience, and maturity that not every organization has, you know, and that's okay. Organizations go through a life cycle. Eventually, they will achieve that experience and maturity, you know, with their systems and their governing board and with their staff, where they'll be competitive for federal grants. So you have to have to ask yourself, are we there yet? Are we ready to take on the application process and the post-award grant management, you know, if we receive a grant. And, and if you're not quite sure, hey, I have an organizational assessment that helps you determine if your organization is truly ready to apply. It's 100% free. I'll provide a link, uh, a link to it in the video's description. Just click on it. It's a PDF file. You don't have to give me your email address or any contact information. Just download it and uh, print it, pass it around, share it. Uh, it's, like I said, totally free. Just use it. Uh, hopefully it helps. I think it will. I mean, I spent quite a bit of time making it, so darn right I think it'll help. <laughs> well, here we are. So just to recap... If you concentrate on all the elements under your control, your grant proposals should be reasonably competitive. I mean, of course, success is never, never guaranteed. All you really want is to be competitive against the other applicants. Now, unfortunately, the items you can't control have a greater impact on the final, in on the final outcome. And, you know, it's not your fault. If Congress didn't appropriate a ton of money, or if you had a reviewer, uh, a reviewer who was in a bad mood and scored you lower, or if there were, you know, too many other successful applicants in your state and you were passed over, so the department could spread the money around geographically. I mean, you can do everything right and still not receive funding. But as long as you're competitive, I mean, that's the key. I mean. Either score high enough to receive a grant, 
obviously, or score close enough to that, you know, funding cutoff line so that you are you are eligible down the road if supplemental funding becomes available. That's that happens quite a bit. But above all else, don't give up. Just just keep trying. Okay, whew. That's all I have. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, please email me through my website or reach out on social media. I'm here to help in any way that I can. If you found this useful, like it or give it a thumbs up. Uh, Feel free to leave a comment. I enjoy feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future presentations. Cool? All right. Thanks. And I will see you next time.